All right, I can still see participants coming in here. So welcome everyone. Feel free to unmute yourself, introduce yourself, let us know where you're calling in from, where you practice in long-term care, or introduce yourself in the chat as well, if you'd like. Hey, Sue Ellen and Cheryl, it's Carol from Eden Gardens in Nanaimo. Hi, Carol. Oh, hi, Carol. So nice to hear your voice. Uh, it's nice to see you guys. I can't believe you're retiring. Well, you know, I am from my formal position, but I'll, I won't be retiring from all the things I love to do. So I still have this passion to change aged care across Canada. That's good. That's good to hear. <laughs> we'll, we'll yes, see. thank God. We'll still be teaching the Eden Alternative philosophy. That's right. Yay. <laughs> and hopefully we'll be back to Eden Gardens. Oh, uh, we're ready for you. Excellent. Well, I think we have um, three of your people maybe in our next class that starts tomorrow. So that's terrific. Yeah, I think Ashley for sure, I think is one. Nice. And Michelle? Oh yeah, yeah. And someone else. I got my list right here. <laughs> Welcome everyone. Welcome Catherine, see you there in the chats. I'm just gonna give it another minute or so while people log in and then we'll get started. Nice to see some people from further up island, Nanaimo. That's great. All right, well, welcome everyone. So I'll just do a quick little interview or introduction here, and then I'll hand it over to the presenters. So I'm Jessica, the LTC operations lead for Victoria South Island. Um, I'd like to take a moment to welcome you to our learning series of eight event on the Eden Alternative. It is with great respect and appreciation that I'm speaking to you today from the traditional and ancestral territories of the Sauk Nation, where I feel very lucky to work and live. Uh, so for to start, just a couple of housekeeping items. So please keep yourself muted as background noise can amplify very quickly. There are CME credits for this event. A member of the LTCI team will email you a certificate in the next week or so for your records. Um, at the end of the evening, we will have an evaluation. Please take a few moments to participate. Your feedback is important to us. Um, this event will be recorded and posted on our website, along with a copy of the slides and handouts from this evening. If you have any questions throughout the evening, be, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask away. There will also be a Q&A portion at the end. So finally, I'd like to introduce our speakers for this evening. So Ellen Beatty and Cheryl George, Global Partners with the Eden Alternative. Sue Ellen has a Bachelor's of Science in Nursing and a Master's in Science from the University of Saskatchewan and is CEO at Sherbrooke Community Society in Saskatoon. She was awarded Woman of Distinction Award for Management from the YWCA, a governor from the Governor General of Canada, a Centennial Medal from the Lieutenant Governor of Saskatchewan, the status of Distinguished Distinguished Alumnus from the University of Saskatchewan College of Nursing, and the Athena Leadership Award. Through the Sherbrooke Learning Center, Sue Ellen has hosted many visitors from around the world who come to see the Eden Alternative philosophy and practice and de the design of the Sherbrooke Villages. She is married to her husband, Tom, and they live in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, and she is the proud grandmother of three. Her second presenter is Cheryl. Cheryl has a Bachelor's of Science in Nursing from the University of Saskatchewan and a Master's of Science in Community Health Education from the University of Oregon. She was Education Leader at Sherbrooke Community Centre in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan for over 28 years, supporting the adoption and implementation of the Eden Alternative Philosophy and now serves on their Board of Directors. She lives in Saskatoon and is the mother of a son, Davis. So without further ado, please welcome Sue Ellen and Cheryl. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, Cheryl and I are absolutely delighted to be here, and this is one of our favorite things uh, to do. So uh, thank you for inviting us for sure. So I think the first thing that we need to talk about is disclosure. And so Cheryl, if you can advance that slide, um, we have nothing to disclose, uh, no conflicts at all. So um, there is our slide. So we'll get on with the presentation. We're going to talk a little bit about Sherbrooke and um, as you both heard in the introduction, um, as you heard, Cheryl and I both have worked at Sherbrooke for many years and um, we're going to use Sherbrooke um, as a, a case 
study really in this presentation because Sherbrooke is um, sort of a living example of the implementation of the Eden philosophy. And so you'll, you'll actually get to see it in practice. So uh, Sherbrooke is a fairly big home. There are 263 residents who live there, 600 staff and 400 volunteers. We have highly engaged staff. Um, in fact, in our province, Aon Hewitt, um, a private company did an engagement survey within the Saskatchewan Health Authority and found that um, the average healthcare employee were about 32% engaged and that include, included our, our physicians. And when they uh, compared Sherbrooke, we were 82% highly engaged. So um, we have some good stats to show that this philosophy works. And of course, when you have highly engaged staff, you get that spontaneous giving of the extra um, bit of energy that you have. Sorry if you hear a little dog barking here. I'm also the proud grandmother of a new little dog. So <laughs> we have two sites um, that our organization is responsible for. And mostly we'll be talking about Sherbrooke today, but we have another home, a smaller home, uh, where 60 residents live. And that's a really great experience for us because uh, we have the experience of the Eden alternative in a large home and a small home. And of course, the, the philosophy grows beautifully anywhere that you find people who are frail or, or disabled. Uh, we are home to um, the Veterans Village and the Marlow White residents and the Sherbrooke Village. And lots of people do come to Sherbrooke to see the village model. And it actually was the inspiration for Dr. Bill Thomas's greenhouse model. He came to see us in, I think it was 2001, and he said, oh my goodness, this is it. And very shortly after that, he designed the greenhouses and began to op open them. And of course, you'll see that model spreading right throughout the US. We are also home to oak trees and acorns, uh, which is a childcare center for 36 children. And that opened in the year 1999. And so we've had children at our place for a long time. And we'll, you'll see pictures of the kids and we'll talk more about them. We are also home to the iGen grade six class, which is a partnership with our public school board. And so that classroom is also based in Sherbrooke. And of course, with the pandemic, we've had to make some alterations and do a lot of virtual things. Uh, but for the most, kid, most part, the kids are, are in our uh, home each and every day. We are a registered home with the Eden Alternative since 1999, and we have milestone four status, which is um, a pretty deep implementation of the philosophy. So now I'm gonna ask Cheryl to talk a little bit about the history of the Eden Alternative. Uh, thank you, Swellen. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be able to talk to you about the Eden Alternative philosophy because it's something that we're so passionate about I always think it's really important to get a little bit of a, a historical perspective on things. Um, the essence of the Eden Alternative philosophy is that it is a model of healthy community uh, where each elder is in control of their own life as much as possible. And in the Eden philosophy, we define an elder as some, somebody who by virtue of life experience is here to teach us and is deserving of our respect. And it's not necessarily an older person. So um, this all got started back in upstate New York uh, by a physician by the name of Dr. Bill Thomas, um, a Harvard Medical School graduate who was born and raised in upstate New York. And after he graduated, he returned um, to his home community. And one of the, the uh, responsibilities that he took on was to become a nursing home medical director. It was just a, a very small home chase called Chase Mountain. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and one day uh, he was called to see a woman who had a rash on her arm. And he went in and had a look and wrote up his prescription and he was headed out the door when she reached up and grabbed his arm and pulled him down and she said, doctor, I'm so lonely. And he had nothing. And when he went home that night, he, he looked in his medical textbooks uh, and found nothing about loneliness at all. And he was determined right there and then that he needed to do something about it. And he was able to get a grant from, the, from New York State and the, the grant was for dementia care research. Um, this is a, a philosophy that's based on, on 10 principles and seven domains of well-being. Um, we consider the 10 principles to be 
uh, really like milestones along the way to help us to, to implement this philosophy. And the seven domains of well-being is really where it is that we want to be, because of course, uh, everyone wants well-being. And we'll talk more about that. So what we'd like to touch on right now is the first two of the 10 principles of the Eden Alternative Philosophy. And the first principle tells us that loneliness, helplessness, and boredom are painful and destructive to our health and well-being. Uh, and we call this the problem statement. So the current medical institutional model um, of care doesn't focus on the whole human being. In the Eden Alternative, we focus on the human spirit as well as the human body. So let's take a look at those three plagues of loneliness, helplessness, and boredom. We define loneliness as the pain we feel when we want but do not have loving companionship. Uh, some of you may think that people living in a nursery home are surrounded by people. How could they be lonely? But without connection, uh, without meaningful relationships, loving companionship, there is loneliness. The second is helplessness, the pain we feel when we always receive care and never give care, which of course puts us very, whoever is in that, that uh, deficit uh, to be really out of balance. And there's always pain when life is out of balance. And the third is boredom, the pain we feel when our lives lack variety and spontaneity. Um, as a, a nurse, that was my original background, I was taught that the most important thing is safety. I've come to realize this creates a life that lacks variety and spontaneity. This is the problem. People are dying of loneliness, helplessness, and boredom. And so now Sue Ellen's going to talk to you about the solution. I think Sue Ellen, you're muted. Um, thank you, Cheryl. I think, um, you know, the last couple of years have really highlighted uh, long-term care and shone a little bit of a spotlight on us. And I'm really grateful for that because I think that everybody became aware that people were lonely, helpless, and bored. And it almost took the pandemic for people to notice our folks. And um, I, I'm really kind of grateful for that having happened through the pandemic. Some good things did come of it. So um, the problem really is that, that people are dying of loneliness, helplessness, and boredom. And here's the, here's the solution. This is the solution statement. And that's really to create this caring, inclusive, and vibrant community, which enables all of us, regardless of age or ability, to experience well-being. And Cheryl did say, regardless of a person's age, we call them elders. And uh, anybody who is lonely, helpless, and bored, or who, who is frail, uh, will we'll suffer from these plagues. So the solution is really to create this really vibrant community where people have all of these opportunities uh, for well-being. And Cheryl and I are going to spend most of our presentation talking about well-being. I just want to highlight the difference between an elder-centered community or a resident-centered community. And I'm not talking about resident-centered care. Uh, in the Eden Alternative, we do resident-directed care, which uh, we'll talk a little bit more about. Uh, but we create a resident-centered community as opposed to a staff-centered community. Um, we don't live, uh, we live in the elders' home. They don't live in our workplace. And so that's a real paradigm shift. So the solution actually is to create this kind of a community. Now, the goal is to have well-being for all. And we need to move out of that medical institutional model and create a human habitat where people thrive and grow. And the medical model is an absolutely wonderful model when we are in acute um, situations. But as you all know, people are living in these homes and they are not acutely ill for the most part. And having to live in a medical model is, um, is it makes absolutely no sense. So we're trying to create a community where the goal is well-being. Dr. Thomas says medical um, treatment is necessary, but insufficient on its own for quality of life. So we're not saying that medical care shouldn't be part of all of this. In fact, what we want is top-notch medical care. So pioneers of culture change, they contend that aging and living with unique health challenges need not be about decline and despair, but instead, 
a chance to joyously soar to new heights of human growth and awareness. So that's what we're after here. So the next slide, Cheryl. We're trying to create what we call a human habitat. And I know that's kind of a hokey term. Um, Cheryl and I used to not even be able to say it and thought it was so, so goofy, but um, really what it means is that we're trying to create a habitat uh, specifically for the species of human beings. And so there are different habitats um, for all kinds of animals. For example, right now I'm in Mexico and the iguanas are just thriving here. But I understand in Florida, when it got cold, they got so cold, they fell out of trees. That was not the right environment for them. And of course, what we're saying here is the institution is not the right environment for human beings to live and thrive in. So we're trying to create this human habitat. And our next slide talks about how we care for the human spirit as well as the human body. And that's a really, really important thing for us to, to remember. So Dr. Thomas defines well-being. He says it's a much larger idea than either quality of life or customer satisfaction. It's based on a holistic understanding of human needs and capacities. Well-being is elusive highly subjective and the most valuable of all human possessions. So he says, um, you know, well-being can be simply defined as a contented state of being. Satisfaction, wellness, and happiness are concepts that are often used interchangeably with well-being. However, satisfaction is based on expectations. If others don't meet them, then we're not satisfied. Uh, wellness implies healthiness, which may peak and decline over time. Happiness, too, is a human emotion that comes and goes. In contrast, well-being evolves and develops over a lifetime, deepening as we grow into our full potential as human beings. Well-being is the path to a life worth living. So we have seven domains of well-being that we strive to create opportunities for. And the first one is identity. And, and Cheryl and I are going to go through all of these and show you pictures of people experiencing these different domains. But the first one is identity. The second is growth. The third is autonomy, security, connectedness, meaning, and joy. And so we will now proceed to um, to talk about those. And I'm going to use my mom as a little bit of a case study here. Um, my mom was one of my greatest teachers. And Dr. Thomas always said, the elders are here to teach us. And this certainly was the case for me with my mom. And so um, I have used her a little bit as a, a case example. So um, my mom was a, a teacher. She actually got her degree when she was uh, in her 40s and went to work full time as a teacher. She was very proud of that. She got her first driver's license when she was 65, so she was pretty ferocious. Um, but she started to get dementia, and she decided that before she couldn't make friends and have relationships, that she would move into assisted living. Now, my father had died um, quite a few years before this, and when my mom moved into assisted living, she got a boyfriend, and she described him as her main squeeze. And so uh, her quality of life was great. Um, Wayne was diabetic and she kind of did things for him that he couldn't do. And he was very clear thinking. And so he kind of navigated decisions for her. So it was a beautiful symbiotic relationship. But my mom started walking on the freeway at night. And um, I would get a phone call to say, you know, your mom's gone out to walk on the freeway again. And so I would come pick her up and she'd always be delighted that, you know, for some reason I was out there and, and wasn't this great and I could give her a ride back. Um, but my sisters and I decided that um, she was going to need to go somewhere where she could be safe and, and not put others at risk. So I brought her to Sherbrooke and um, she knew Sherbrooke really well because I'd worked there for a long time. She'd been a volunteer there for a long time. And um, we had had family members live there as well, my nephew and my dad and my parents-in-law. So she was really familiar with the place and she agreed to come stay for a few days, but I brought her into one of the houses in the village. And uh, unbeknownst to me, there was a cat that lived in that house. And my mother, her entire life had been phobic about this cat. And so I remember coming in the house that day and she looked around, she saw this cat and she looked around and she looked at all the people and she said, I can't stay here. Um, this was a secure house, a memory care house, as we lovingly called it. 
Um, and everybody in the house had dementia and it was secure. And of course, that's why I brought my mom there. And she looked around and she said to me, everyone here is crazy. I can't stay here. And you know, I looked around and I thought, oh my goodness, what have I done? I see exactly what she's saying to me. There's nobody here who can help her. So it, that was a big aha moment for me. And um, we have worked since that time to um, become dementia inclusive, inclusive and not segregate our people with dementia. So we've been working very hard on that with the um, encouragement of Dr. Al Power. So um, we know that about 60% of people who are in long-term care have dementia. And so they already are integrated. Uh, but it was, a, it was a huge aha for me to watch my mom come into this situation. So I just want to talk a little bit about identity because my mom had a very strong identity. Um, she was very well known. She had incredible personhood. Uh, she was a real character, a real individual. Um, she was very whole and she had a, a history that she was very proud of. And so her identity was, was really clear. And this is the first domain of well-being. And it's really important for us to know who these people are so that we can see them in a different light, not as frail people um, who we design care plans for and we, we focus on their deficits as opposed to who they are, the strengths they bring and, and the dreams that they have. So when we use well-being as our frame of reference, that care plan becomes really individualized and focuses on the strengths and preferences and the goals and growth of the person. So we always put our relationship with the elder above the completion of a task. And we do not complete a task at the expense of our relationship with elders. And one of our OTs say, uh, says relationships trump tasks. And I think one of the things we know about in the institution is people have this list of tasks and they call it giving care. And it's sort of like, we've got to get it done. And of course that e erodes the personhood, the identity of the person that we're in care partnership with. So in the Eden alternative, we partner with people uh, to provide um, life worth living. So the next picture is my mom. You can see she's a bit of character. She was a very fancy woman. She, uh, she always was, um, she always had her makeup on. She was always dressed. She always looked lovely. And um, that's how she came at Sherbrooke. And of course she changed a lot um, while she was there, but actually she was growing and changing uh, with her dementia as well. And that's one of the things I've noticed. Families want to keep people the way that they were when they came or how they used to be. And I did watch my mom um, grow in some ways I really didn't like, um, but you know, to respect her and support who she was, was really important. The next picture has um, a group of our staff, actually that's uh, one of our environmental service uh, staff with some people who come to the community day program. And these guys had a pool group and that was part of their identity. And you can also see they have name tags on, which is also really important. And it helps us to get to know each other. And of course, Dale Carnegie always says people's favorite word is, is their own name. They love to hear it. The next uh, character here is one of our veterans. And um, he has quite an identity. We think he looks like this bird. We think they, that they must have the same hairdresser. Uh, but people have very specific things about them who make them who they are. So personal style is one of them. So we are home to the veterans for our province. And one of the things that we were asked by Veterans Affairs Canada was to maintain the identity of the veterans. So we worked really hard to make sure that we do all of these things. And so uh, the Legion would come and we would have the snowbirds come and the skyhawks come. In fact, I think you'll see the skyhawks or the snowbirds. No, these are actually the skyhawks. They, they actually jumped out of the planes and landed on the park uh, behind our home. So very important to be maintaining that kind of identity. The next three women are assuming new identities. Uh, we put up a green screen one day and um, these are folks who, um, they look pretty able, but uh, they're people who were in Sherbrooke because they had dementia. And of course they all dressed up and had their photos taken and had uh, just such a great time. 
And the next one is a picture of our kids. Uh, these are kids from the daycare. And of course, they're taking on new identities as well. But each of these kids uh, has a character of their own. And for them to be well known in Sherbrooke was, was really important as well. And so identity, our first domain of well being, knowing someone, um, having them belong. Thanks, Cheryl. The second is uh, domain of well being is growth. Uh, development, enrichment, unfolding, expanding, evolving. The, the institutional model of care centers on mitigating decline and disability, but a person-directed model offers a radically different belief. In a person-directed care model, elders and their care partners have the opportunity to grow. The opposite of growth is death, both physical and spiritual. Individuals living with frailty continue to grow and teach us how to be human beings in a caring community. People walking in forgetfulness teach us how creative we are, how patient we are, how loving and kind we are, how intuitive we are, and how much empathy we have. They teach us how to be good human beings. An opportunity to grow a garden is, a power, is, is very powerful and involves mem memories of, of a lifetime for many people, um, especially here on the prairies where, where gardening is always very, very big. Um, of course, with our four seasons, our, our growth uh, period is a little bit more limited uh, than out there at the coast. Uh, being part of a bell choir, um, together we can make beautiful music. I'm always amazed at what beautiful music people who walk in forgetfulness can make. There's clearly learning and growth happening here. This is our butterfly project from cocoon to butterfly. With the elders, we experience the circle of life. And our, our children, uh, volunteers, the iGen kids, um, the kids from oak trees and acorns, they love the butterflies every year, the monarch butterflies. And of course, we have our own little butterflies. These are kids from the oak trees and acorns. Um, and they bring such joy uh, when they join in the elders, with the elders uh, on, on many projects of growth. Um, this is a picture taken out in our community garden. It's actually uh, shared with the greater community. And it, the, there's lots of people from, that live surrounding Sherbrooke um, that grow plots here. Uh, but it's really wonderful for our elders to be able to have uh, to be able to grow a garden as well. So the relationships that grow in this rich soil of a garden are really pretty amazing, and it keeps our elders as part of the greater community, and and it helps the the community to understand who we are and that we're just real people. And Swan's going to tell you about this hundredth birthdays special. Um this was such a great story. This is Grace, and you can see on her door the, the balloons that say 100. And um, she, this, this actually was a picture in the Star Phoenix in Saskatoon, which is our local paper. And she, um, her father had taught her that growing a garden was just a frivolous activity, and she was never allowed to do it. And so for her 100th birthday, she got her first harvest out of her garden box at Sherbrooke. And she was just so delighted with the harvest. She just absolutely couldn't believe it. So, um, you know, when people have this opportunity to grow and, and learn new things, um, it, it, it's just such a, an amazing experience. So yeah, there's Grace on her 100th birthday, picking her radishes and carrots for the very first time in her life. Okay, the next domain of well-being is autonomy. And uh, this one is, is just so critically important. And I believe that this is the reason so many people do not want to come to long-term care. It's because they're going to lose their autonomy. And um, you know, everybody in, in the world has lost autonomy in the last two and a half years because of that pandemic. And so we, we all got a little taste of what this is like uh, to be confined to places, to be told where we could go, when we could go, um, whether we were to stay home and to have all of these rules, we got a little bit of a taste of what it might be like to live in long-term care and have somebody else make all those decisions for you. So we define autonomy as liberty, self-governance, self-determination, immunity from the arbitrary exercise of authority, which is what it felt like for the last two and a half years in the pandemic, and to have choice and to have freedom. 
And it's interesting because we, we also define the institution as being a place where uh, someone um, at the top has um, authority and control over the day-to-day -day lives of the people who live and work there. And of course, that's not what we want. Um, we're, we're not gonna get much of a chance to talk about learning circles, but they're a tool that we use in the Eden Alternative. And um, you know, when we, um, one of our favorite learning circles is to have people define home. And this is almost always something that everybody shares. It's sort of a place where I'm surrounded by the things that are important to me, that I am in charge, I am in control, I get to do the things I want, I feel safe. And so autonomy is such a big piece of, of well-being. So simply put, autonomy is sort of being your own person and to be respected for being who you are, to control your own life and um, to make um, decisions. Do you have the right to folly when you have autonomy? And um, that's something that um, people also experienced in the last couple of years is not being able to measure that risk benefit for themselves about uh, what they would, would do. And so um, all of us have experienced a little bit of this. Uh, one thing we talk about in Eden is something we call surplus safety. And you heard Cheryl talk a little bit about when she was uh, educated as a nurse, she was taught that safety was the most important thing. And I would say that there has been a lot of surplus safety um, when we have talked to lots of elders over the last two years, they, many of them say, um, I wish I had had the choice to live at risk instead of somebody taking all of those choices away from me. And when we're talking about open family presence right now, that's also what people are saying is that I need to be able to choose to, to live at risk. And, you know, a lot of these people are very mature people who have a lot of wisdom. And so autonomy um, is such an important uh, domain of well-being. So um, we try to provide as many choices as we possibly can. So at Sherbrooke, we would um, really promote choices like when do you get up and, and when do you go to bed? And of course, some of these things are difficult with staffing levels, but what you do is the very best you can and you negotiate with people and you trade, you trade off. Um, we give people choices about uh, what to participate in or to not participate. And sometimes we come in conflict with families because they want their family member participating in everything because they think if they're busy, they're happy. And of course, what people really want to do is choose the things that are meaningful to them. And Cheryl will be talking about that a little bit more. We also want to choose uh, who to hang out with, You know, who our friends are, who we associate with. And that was another thing in, in the pandemic where people lost the ability to, to see many of the people who were really important to them. Also, what to wear. Um, in lots of long-term care homes, the staff put out the clothes the night before. And the day staff come and dress the person without even asking them what it is they want to wear. But this is a really important choice. And even if you have dementia, you can choose, do I want to wear the blue shirt or the red shirt? Um, all of those choices are just so critically important. We should be able to choose what to eat. And often we'll say to staff, um, well, sh could, should people be able to choose dessert first if they're uh, in a care home? And staff always say, oh yeah, they should be able to. But then we watch people say to people who are you know, in their 80s, no, you need to eat your supper first instead of your dessert first. And I'm thinking, you know that, I might tell my grandchildren that, um, but we, people have earned the right to have these choices. Uh, we need the choice to, uh, to watch what we want to watch or listen to. Uh, Cheryl and I were at a home actually out in the lower mainland and we came in and everybody was lined up and watching television. And I, I remember I leaned to Cheryl and I said, what are the chances all these people want to watch the same show? And I think it was pretty much zero chance, um, but that's what we've done in long-term care is lined people up and put them in front of televisions and, and given them no choices. And sometimes, you know, I would come into a house at Sherbrooke and I would find the TV on with Oprah. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm not pretty, I'm not sure that this is the resident's choice. I think the staff are wanting to watch Oprah. And so uh, very often you have to watch those things because the staff want to choose what they watch or listen to as well. And then the last choice that I listed here is just when to come and when to go. And, you know, some places in long term care, even though you're cognitively well, they want you to sign in to sign out. Um, and again, it's surplus safety. 
Um, we have a, a, some standards of care in Saskatchewan, and that's one of the things. And our residence council said, there's no way we're signing in and signing out. Nobody's going to make me do that. Uh, so people need to have those, those choices. So I'm just going to share with you our mission at Sherbrooke, because it really is about choice. Um, Sherbrooke Community Centre creates a community that supports each person to live a full and abundant life. And each person chooses to live differently. And that's the thing that we need to respect is the autonomy of, of the individual. And that's what our mission is really, really geared to. The next picture is a picture of Residence Council. And uh, we have a Residence Council that has representatives from all over our, our um, neighborhoods at Sherbrooke. There's 14 different neighborhoods. And of course, in the last um, year or two, we've had to do it over WebEx or Zoom. And so uh, this worked pretty well, but we had our residence council and they, they have lots of feedback about what we're doing there. And in fact, the gentleman with the red shirt in the bottom is Ross McKay and he sits on our board of directors. And so that's uh, how important the residence voice is. Okay, the next picture shows uh, Kama and um, this is about autonomy. She's decided to, to have tattoos and uh, she needs to have all those choices as well. And so we see people expressing themselves very differently these days. I'm in Mexico right now. And boy, am I ever seeing a lot of tattoos. It's absolutely remarkable. Um, and apparently people want you to look at them. So, um, so I'm really enjoying the tattoos here. But they're about um, expressing your autonomy as well. The next picture is Esther and she's in the Vintners Club. And um, this, was, this is another thing. Um, people will often email us and say, do you allow people to drink al alcohol? And of course, allow is, means we've got all the authority, right? I mean, I might allow my grandchildren to do something, certainly not to drink alcohol, but there's no, there, I have no authority to allow Esther to drink alcohol or not drink alcohol. And so we have lots of different clubs uh, where people can express their autonomy. And so one of Esther's favorite things was the Vintners Club where, where they made wine and had hors d'oeuvres every week. Okay, Cheryl. Thanks, Suellen. Um, the next is security, freedom from doubt, anxiety, or fear. Safe, assured, having privacy, dignity, and respect. And really, uh, you know, Suellen's already talked about surplus safety. Um, and so we have to be really careful in terms of security. Um, it really expands beyond the basic need for safety uh, to also include privacy and dignity and respect. Um, you know, people are sharing very intimate things and, you know, is that going to get written down on the chart? Is everybody else going to read that? Um, my mom actually lived the last uh, two and a half years of her life at Sherbrooke and she was living with dementia and one of my sisters said to me one time, do they write down every time we come to see mom and everything we say? And, and of course, uh, we need to be, you know, in, in the old uh, institutional model, we used to not really think much about sharing people's very private stuff. And, you know, we rationalized that we were doing it in their best interest and all the rest of it. And one of the things that, that the Eden philosophy has taught me is not to share people's stories unless I have their permission to do that. Um, a person who's receiving support um, often finds their space becoming very public. Uh, forcing them um, into involuntary intimate situations with strangers. Um, uh, a nurse, Judith Carboni, did uh, research on um, institutionalization and in interviewing people. Um, they felt like they lived in the public domain. They felt homeless. And so I think that's really something that we need to listen to. Um, our healthcare system is very risk averse. Uh, especially when it's uh, got nurses like the one that uh, those that trained me. Um, and it seems that once an individual relies on the support of others on the care partner team, they find their safety maximized and their opportunities to take risks diminished, if not removed entirely. So uh, really to take away all risk and chances to make mistakes is to take away our right to be human, to be adults. Um, and actually maximizing safety really creates insecurity. So we make each interaction with our elders one that will enhance their feelings of being well-known and, and their trust in us. 
Uh, we work to gain that trust of elders so they feel safe in their home. Uh, we believe that it's easier to place your trust in a friend than in a stranger. And we never, never force care. Um, I actually have uh, friends right now that um, the husband is living with dementia and it's, uh, they've made the decision as a family that it's time for him uh, to move into long-term care. And, and so my friend wrote to me and she said, what's the one thing that you would, would be really, you know, it was really important for you to find. And I wrote back, you know, to never ever uh, force him to do anything against his will. And I think that's a really important one. Um, we promote a feeling of calm in stressful situations. We lovingly support elders when they're having a bad day. We understand that everyone has a need to express feelings of sadness and anger that occur due to life's challenging, challenges and experiences. Um, and we only use words to describe elders that we would use to describe ourselves or someone that we love. Um, there are so many disrespectful labels that have been put on elders over the years. We respect the privacy and dignity of all elders in all situations. We know that this helps to build trust. And we always put the elder first and work flexibly, flexibly uh, within our teams so that the relationships that staff care partners develop with elders is what determines who the elders care partners will be. We ensure that environmental conditions of the elders home are guided by their needs and their choices, lighting, sound, noise, temperature. Um, all of those things are a very, very important part of, of feeling secure um, in your home. I love this picture of Art of sleeping uh, on the couch in the living room. And you know that she feels secure if she's able to, to curl up on the sofa and go to sleep. So that's a, a really, really important, I, I just love that picture. I think it says it so well. Um, this is a picture of uh, a patio outside of one of the village houses at Sherbrooke. And uh, security is, is having a place that we feel at home to be outside to tend living things. Um, and this is in the, the internal street of the village, uh, the house front. Uh, it, it tells us that this is, this is uh, people's home. This is where, where people live. Um, security is really about having a place where you feel at home. So, Ellen. Okay, thanks, Cheryl. Um, you know, some people have commented on the fence that Cheryl just showed us and said it looks a little bit institutional. Um, you know, but people really love that fence because it gives them a sense of security and but they can still see through it out to the outside. And just like uh, we all have fences, well, most of us have fences around our, our yards at home. Uh, the elders do uh, want that too. And it was interesting during COVID, we had to create so many different areas for people to go outside so that we weren't mixing all these neighborhoods because we were trying to make smaller groups of people in case we had an outbreak. And we put up just miles of fencing on our property and, and made an area kind of like a yard for each neighborhood. And at the end of this, when we got permission really to, to have people be together, people wanted to keep those because they loved their private space. And they said to us, could we do something you know, to make this nicer? And so at our home at Central Haven, we ended up putting up new fencing and making it like an outdoor living room and you know, doing things that we never would have thought we would do. And it was really about having a place of my own, feeling that, that sense of security. So I just wanted to comment on that, that fence. So connectedness, uh, this is a really big deal. If this is the state of being connected and being alive, belonging, being engaged and involved, not detached and connected to the past, present and future, connected to your personal possessions and connected to place and connected to nature. You know, it's interesting when, um, when we were going to be building the village at Sherbrooke, I knew building that institutional looking um, nursing home was just the wrong thing to do. And uh, I went out into the community and I spoke with people who lived there who could have come into a care home, but chose not to. And I said to them, you know, how do you feel about coming to a care home? And they said, well, they'd quite frankly rather die. And really what it was about was losing connection 
to all of the things that were important to them, um, to having their own space, to having their, their meals cooked in the home, having being connected to a group of staff who were just their staff, same people at, every day, being connected to a normal environment, and you know, to having all of those choices that you don't have in the institution. So connectedness is something people really do lose when, when they move into a home. And so it's, it's more than just being surrounded, you know, by people who are friendly or skilled. It's about being in meaningful and deep relationships. And so um, we do not rotate our staff around at Central Haven or Sherbrooke. We want people to be in close and continuing contact so that they can be connected and be in, in deep personal relationships. Um, otherwise, uh, people become lonely, helpless and bored. And you know the connection that happens between um, our staff and our residents is just so incredibly important. I mean, we've had residents who helped um, staff members lose weight, or who helped them plan their weddings, or uh, you know who bought baby gifts and planned showers. And um, you know, you you when you're connected like this, you create a normal community. And one of the things we have noticed is that in the institution, when people are not connected in relationship, they often compete for the staff's time. But in a, in a human habitat or a place designed, you know, based on love and kindness and these domains of well-being, people become friends and the elders get connected to each other and they care about each other. So those relationships are just such a, an incredible connection. And of course, there's a whole bunch of other uh, things that we want to be connected to. And um, this next slide is um, one of our fellows from the Community Day program, the fellow out front in the red shirt. He moved, he moved over to Central Haven to our home. Uh, his care needs became too difficult for his family to, ma to manage at home. And so um, these are actually people in the day program who got on the Sherbrooke bus and came over with staff to visit him in his new home. And so trying to keep those friendships and those connections alive, uh, just so incredibly important. And so um, they worked hard to do that. Connections to extended family, just hugely important to have uh, families be welcome, to be kid friendly. And um, these are just uh, connections that, that everybody enjoys and really, really important. Um, you know, I had a, a friend uh, whose grandfather died today and he was 99, just about 100. He didn't make it to his 100th birthday and he died this afternoon. And when Jana was gonna go in to see him, she, they said, you know, he's not going to know who you are. And she went in and he said, oh, Jana, Right. And the connection was just so strong and so powerful. And he said the sweetest thing to her. He said, is my mom OK? And she said, oh, yeah, your mom's just fine. And then he passed away. Um, but those connections to extended family and to the past, to the present are just so incredibly important. So family just, you know, every effort to make family welcome and, um, you know, actually putting them to work. When we get when we get them in our home, I mean, people play the piano. People can write write stories. They can read stories. They can do book clubs. They can volunteer in, in so many different kinds of things. Um, so that's really important uh, for so many people. As Cheryl mentioned, that connection to nature and to the earth is just critically important. And so uh, this is again out in the community garden. And um, there's a lot of raised beds here. And you know, a lot of these residents are very physically disabled and they really can't do the gardening, but people in the community come and take direction from them and help them with their gardens. And so that connection to gardening and to those gardeners is just really, really important for people. And then connection to familiar music and, and dancing. Um, you know, this is old fiddle time music, which a lot of our folks just really love. I love it. Um, I probably got familiar with it from working at Sherbrooke and have kind of grown to love it. Um, but, you know, doing all of these things that connect people to memories about being at that small town dance and doing all those kinds of things that brought them joy in their youth. Really, really important connections. And then connection to the outdoors and the community. Um, you know, we have lots of events at Sherbrooke and um, I'm looking forward to this summer when we're able to do those things again. And you know, inviting the community in um, for a barbecue or, or for some entertainment, 
Um, here the kids are all serving ice cream and um, yeah, just really wonderful uh, connections for people to, to maintain. And the next one here is, um, you know, women, um, these three women all have, um, well, actually two of them have dementia. One of them is um, as a volunteer, um, but dancing again and, um, you know, remembering <laughs> how girls used to always dance together at the small town dances and those things and just having, having so much fun, but those connections to things of the past. And then new connections. This is, uh, these are our iGen kids and this is at Christmas and they're all, uh, this is the uh, shortest day of the week, the year, the winter sol solstice. And uh, these kids are all dressed in their pajamas. We say at Sherbrooke, why bother getting dressed? The day is so short. Um, it's just about dark, except for maybe six hours of the day. And so we do this on this day every year on the winter solstice. And so these are residents connected with, uh, with the iGen kids. And I don't know if you want to talk any more about that, Cheryl, but well, just uh, the, the, the bringing the, the grade six students into Sherbrooke has been one of the most wonderful experiences. They bring such energy and such joy and the, the relationships that they develop, the, the connectedness is just you know, over the top. Um, and it's been a, a real challenge for the last while for them not to be able to have uh, such close connection with the elders. But yes, iGen has, has just been a, a fabulous addition to to Sherbrooke. Um, and uh, so many people have said, well, why doesn't every home do this? And, and of course, it would be wonderful if every home had it for sure. But it's been a great addition to Sherbrooke. The next uh, domain is meaning. Uh, it's about significance, heart, hope. Um, it's about having purpose in life. Um, and, and meaning is, is a really uh, sacred part of life. Um, and, and unfortunately, um, institutions have been based on a medical model of care, which really strips away meaning in many different ways. Um, the physical environment becomes meaningless for anyone except the person who did the decorating or the staff who see it as their workplace. And remember, Sue Ellen said that, that uh, this is, uh, we work in their home, they don't live in our workplace. And that's a really important distinction for people to understand. We find out what makes life meaningful for each, el uh, for each elder and what it is that makes each elder get out of bed every morning. Um, and I'm going to talk about simple pleasures in a moment because they're a really important part of meaning. Uh, we understand that for activity to be meaningful, it must tie into the elder's personal values and perspective. Um, and we ensure that elder rituals take the place of organizational routines. We understand that we need to be in the moment with elders and that the antidote to boredom is variety and spontaneity. Um, this fellow was lost in his music. Uh, it gave him great meaning to play for hours. He also provided pleasure for others and this role gave him meaning as well. Um, in the Eden Alternative, we talk a lot about simple pleasures. And there, whoops, I've gone too far there. Just a sec here. Um, simple pleasures are something that, that we all enjoy. Um, and uh, years ago, we were at a, an amusement park and my son had brought a friend along and we were in this very long lineup and it seemed like we were standing there for hours and there was music playing overhead. And all of a sudden, Jordan looked up and he, he got this really sweet look on his face. And he said, this music makes me feel unusually good about myself. And I thought, wow, that's a great way to describe a simple pleasure. Something that just makes you feel really good. Um, years and years ago, Sue Ellen and I worked with a woman. She was a, a manager uh, where people were living with dementia. And she said, that our most important job is to provide pleasurable moments. Uh, and she reminded us that people who are living with dementia may not remember what it was that brought them the pleasure, but that feeling would stay with them. And so to be able to bring those simple pleasures is such an important thing. And it may be as simple as, you know, a favorite chocolate, uh, the, for others, a, a good cup of coffee or tea, um, the beauty of nature, uh, watching the children play, uh, meaningful relationships, 
Um, it reminds me of a story uh, that a staff member told me. Uh, she said that she was uh, helping an elder back to her room after supper. It was in the winter time and it was snowing and there was a light outside of the window. And so you could see the snow coming down and, and the elder said, oh, I love to watch the snow um, sparkle in the light. And so the staff member, the staff care partner, you know, uh, took her over to the window and they stood there and just enjoyed the snow for, for just a very small length of time. And then she said, okay, I'm, I'm ready to go to my room. And that night as the, the staff member was helping her to bed, she said, I just wanna thank you. It was such a pleasure to share that moment with you of watching the snow come down. And it's not something that takes a lot of extra time it's just really, really important. So, um, I, so I want to say a word about this cat as well, because um, this cat's name was Jerry, and he was a palliative care cat. And I'm not sure if all of you are familiar with that, but there are some cats, not all, but some cats who have um, an, an instinct uh, when people are dying and they stay with them. And so um, it's been a really wonderful thing over the years. I remember telling my mom about palliative care cats before she came to live at Sherbrooke and my mom loved animals and she loved cats. And, and so um, the cat in the neighborhood, my, my family members and my dad and I, we all did everything we could to get this cat to spend as much time in my mom's room as possible. But early on, she said to me with a kind of a wide eyed look, um, is it one of those? And it's like, no, no, mom, this is the palliative care cat. You're not dying. So I thought it was just quite amusing that she made that connection. Um, this is a, a woman who um, came to live with us uh, with dementia, um, sleeping about 20 hours a day. She didn't really have a reason to get out of bed. And we know that to care for other living things brings meaning to so many people. And so her family gave her birds that gave her a reason to get up in the morning. Um, and so it's such a, a wonderful thing to realize how important that the pets can be. And here's Irene, the habits and skills of a lifetime. Uh, being able to contribute to the meal connects Irene to her role um, as, as, a, as a mom, as a homemaker, caring for her family. Uh, she may not have been able to tell you how to make a pie, but you set her up with a pie shell and the apples and a sharp knife and she'll make it happen. Uh, lots of times people are worried about that sharp knife, you know, surplus safety. Um, but, you know, we always want to set people up to be successful. And if we'd given Irene a dull knife, she wouldn't have been able to, to uh, peel and core the apples. And we wanted her to be successful. So that's an important aspect for us to remember in terms of meaning as well. Um, Painting to express himself. This brings meaning to Larry's life. Um, because of his cerebral palsy, he's unable to paint with his hands, but he was set up for success and he found great joy in his painting. And Kathleen, I could tell you stories all day about Kathleen. She was such a character. Uh, she was a war bride and she was um, a painter and a writer. And when she came to live with us, um, because of her disability, she wasn't able to paint in the way that she had all of her life. Uh, but being an artist, she was very comfortable. Uh, we have a, a creative arts studio at Sherbrooke. And so she was really comfortable. That was, that was her place. Um, she didn't want to paint, but that's where she wanted to be. And in time, and with the encouragement of our artist in residence, she realized that she could still find meaning in her art, uh, even if it was in new and different ways. And so it was, it was very wonderful to see Kathleen be able to find meaning in this way. Uh, she also brought so much meaning to, to all of our lives because she was such a character. She, uh, she became a, one of the things she loved to draw was caricatures of, of people. And she was so good at it that we all knew right away who it was that she was drawing, even though it was like a characterization of the individual. So it brought all of us a lot of joy. Uh, to contribute to life in your home brings meaning and Leo loved to clear the tables. And Grant loved, loves collecting coffee grounds around Sherbrooke. 
uh, and then he takes them down to food services for composting. And there's a large compost bin outside for the community gardens. So he knows that there's great meaning in the work that he's doing. Uh, we also uh, find meaning in our culture and the traditions and, and rituals of our culture. Uh, one of our houses in the village is for people of Aboriginal ancestry. And these men with the assistance of occupational therapy were able to make their own drums. And then the music they created was even sweeter for them. And a new planting season in the community garden brings hope to the gardeners. Uh, passing on wisdom from the elders to the students brings great meaning. And so to be able to work together the, the children and the elders uh, was such a pleasure, is such a pleasure. And this is the, the iGen classroom. Uh, they don't spend very much time there, uh, but um, the, the woman in the wheelchair is uh, Dr. Jody. And she has her doctorate in, she, had, she has, has, has died, but she had her doctorate in education and early childhood um, uh, was, was her, a, a really important focus for her. And it really brought great meaning back into her life with the iGen class. Uh, she formed a special bond with these grade six students every year. And she was also a great support to the iGen teachers. Um, and so what a, a wonderful addition to uh, create meaning for people. Sue Ellen. Okay, this is my favorite one. This is joy. And this is the last of the domains of well-being. And it's, you know, it's about happiness, pleasure, delight, contentment, and enjoyment. And of course, it's deeper and more encompassing than happiness. It sort of emerges from moments that occur when relationships are really deep and, and rich and, and meaningful. And so um, we're looking for joy each and every day. And I'll just show you um, a few um, people that, you know, when we found things that were meaningful to them. Uh, this is one of our, our veterans, and he had a remote control car, and he would chase the staff down the hall with the car. It was just hilarious. But he would just laugh and laugh and laugh, and it was just such a, a, a good, fun time. The next pictures of our babies in our, um, our oak trees and acorns, and of course, they're, they're body painting. And um, I don't know what it is right now, apparently, and I don't do this, but I'm going to go on. People love watching these cat videos online and, and laughing. And I think it's probably got to be like this because this is so funny to watch. Um, but this is the joy of having these kids around. I mean, if you don't have them around, you're never going to see anything like this. So uh, tons of joy from these little kids. And then just watching the kids out in the sprinkler. This is one of my favorite pictures at Sherbrooke. They just got soaked. And the elders were out there remembering their own kids running through the sprinkler in, in, the, in their yard. And so just uh, so much joy from the children. My mom, I told you, was a teacher. And uh, I remember one of our volunteers saying to me, I understand now why you have children at Sherbrooke. She said, I watched your mom from a distance as the kids came towards her and her face just lit up. And um, the little kids from Oak Trees and Acorns used to come every Tuesday morning to my mom's house and sit around her and she would read them a story. And it was really kind of funny because she'd, she'd repeat a page or something and they'd tell her right away. Uh, but she had that real teacher authority and she kind of kept that group in, in check, but it brought her uh, such joy. And then um, music and dancing again, we've seen lots of pictures, but these two have, um, they're listening to music and we realized um, when we watched Joan, we didn't know what she was listening to. So we, we got a splitter and put it on the music so both people could wear the earphones and hear the same music. And so we can't even hear what they're listening to, but they're dancing away and just having such a good time. Um, this is our bike at Sherbrooke and we've had this for ages. Um, we have this big internal street. Uh, we call it an internal street. It's just a great big hallway. The houses open into it and some of the uh, surface areas. But um, this bike will go to the Dairy Queen when, when the weather is nice and just huge joy to get on a bike and ride it, especially when Susan, the staff member, is going to do most of the work. So, you know, a lot of people don't get on a bike again and, and to do that is huge. Next picture is my mom and my mom played the piano and um, I have three sisters. Music was a really big thing in our house. Uh, we all sang and um, my mother just lit up when she could hear her favorite songs, but it has to be her favorite songs. 
And so I remember when we first got this for her, the idea came from that uh, documentary, Alive Inside, uh, encourage people to watch it. And the staff said, well, what are we gonna do when the batteries run out? And I said, well, she'll give it to you because she won't watch it anymore because the music will be gone. And so uh, just uh, so much joy to be had for music, uh, but it needs to be your music. And then the next picture is Donna. Uh, working in our tumbleweed gift and thrift. We have a store at Sherbrooke and uh, all the proceeds go to our foundation, which buys things for residents. But all of the uh, volunteers work with an elder in the store. And so it's an opportunity for meaningful work. And you can clearly see Donna loves it. And so she would just squeal when she got to work. Uh, this next picture is Ken with one of the iGen students. And uh, I actually think this might, is this his grandson, Cheryl? Yes, it is. Um, each of the kids got to choose somebody to give them their little graduation scroll. And so this is Ken giving his, his grandson um, his graduation scroll. And you can just see the emotion and how, how much joy he's experiencing. And then again, the next picture is just music and dance again. And this is Wes, and he brings so much joy to people. That's our director of care, Dancing with Joan. And you'll notice how people are dressed at Sherbrooke and Central Haven. Because we're not in that medical model, we're actually... Uh, we wear street clothes and they're comfortable and they're normal and they don't make people think that they're sick. They make people think that they're living life, which is what they are doing. And so I just wanted to kind of point that out. Um, next picture is Stuart. And um, this, is a, uh, this is a car, a go-kart that one of our maintenance guys made. And, and this is about being empowered and engaged. Um, our maintenance staff person made this car and Stuart would drive around in the park behind us and Stuart has a brain injury. Um, so the next picture, Stuart's challenged me and I'm actually in the cart and I'm driving it around Sherbrooke and uh, I actually decided to take it for a spin into the cafeteria. And so there I am, you can see the look on the staff's faces. But you know, we have this saying at Sherbrooke and it's an Eden saying, when the rabbi dances, everybody dances. And so when I came through the cafeteria in this go-kart, I tell you, there was a ton of talk and a ton of laughing about it, um, but it's about modeling the way. So that's joy and um, the domains of well-being. There's seven of them. Identity, growth, autonomy, security, connectedness, meaning, and joy. And, you know, Cheryl and I don't have enough time to tell you how to make all this happen, but I'll, I'll tell you... Um, what uh, we say about Eden, we say the secret sauce of the Eden alternative is the empowerment of staff. And what we try to do is we try to create conditions where our staff experience all of these domains of well being while they are at work. And so we try to create that environment for our staff and they in turn become so engaged and they, they become creative and they want to invest and give that extra bit of themselves to make all these things happen that Cheryl and I have showed you. So the secret sauce is really that empowerment of the staff and the loving of the staff. And I really seriously use that word love. Uh, we actively love the staff and we sit down and we have these conversations with our staff about their opportunities to have identity, growth, autonomy, security, connectedness, meaning and joy while they're working in the residence home. So it can be different. And I guess that's the really good news is that it can be different. And lots of people are making these very institutional homes into places where people want to live. And we just wanna see more of that happen. Okay, I think we're open for questions now, um, if anybody has any. You can unmute yourself if you wish and just ask away. So, Ellen, I'm, I'm going to send a bunch of people from Broadmead to go and spend time with you at, uh, at, at Sherbrooke just to get a better handle on uh, how you do it and uh, how you can do all the things that you do to make your place so wonderful. We'd love to have them, Dale, and, and we do actually have a learning center. Uh, we've actually got a, a group from Manitoba coming in April, so yeah, we're very open to that, so we can connect you with uh, Robin and she can arrange a visit, so love to have people. Thank you. The other thing that's happening right now is because of the uh, pandemic, uh, instead of doing traveling and doing in-person workshops, uh, we're providing our certified Eden associate training online. And so uh, they're done through Zoom classes, just like this. 
and uh, are actually our next uh, Zoom class starts tomorrow. So uh, we, we're still taking registrations if anybody is interested, uh, just get in touch with me. I know this was probably a little bit like drinking from a fire hose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah hi it's ralph in uh, chilliwack here just a question you you mentioned at the beginning uh, one slide you have a lot of volunteers um how much do you rely on the volunteers because we very much handicapped in the people's republic of british columbia from using volunteers People's Republic, I love it. Um, we just actually got permission today um, or encouragement today, the change in policy through the Saskatchewan Health Authority, but we have had our volunteers come in through the pandemic. We, we carefully chose them, but we rely on them so much. Um, you know, we have things like Diners Club where a restaurant comes in and people buy their tickets and come into our uh, Tawa um, Centre, which is our auditorium to have this fancy meal. And the whole thing is served by volunteers, right? Um, all of our events outside involve volunteers, all of our garden boxes, uh, every resident has a volunteer, uh, the music uh, programs, the uh, just about everything involves volunteers. And one of the things we really do is encourage families to volunteer when they come. And then of course the iGen students stay and they volunteer. And we've got some of them who just graduated grade 12 and they're still coming back to volunteer. So uh, we have past family members who found a home for themselves at Sherbrooke. I mean, just a home psychologically, who continue to come and work in the tumbleweed gift and thrift. So we're, we're very reliant on volunteers. How many grade six students are there, Sue Ellen? I think this year there's 24. We, there's usually, I think that's about the maximum we take. Is that correct, Cheryl? What number did you say, Swan? 24. Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah. It's a regular classroom. And it, um, I mean, I know it sounds a bit smaller. Lots of our classes in the city are 30, but kids from all over the city apply to come. And we usually have so many kids that now it's almost like a lottery system to see who gets in because the program uh, is so popular. And I think we're in our seventh year. And of, and of course the kids uh, benefit greatly from that uh, relationship as well. Absolutely, it's huge. They develop such leadership skills. It's quite remarkable. I remember during the first year of iGen, we had a, a, a parent and, and children night and everybody came and, and the theme that seemed to emerge from that day was one of the biggest things the children were learning was empathy. And wow, what a great thing to learn. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody asked, oh, sorry. Especially in this day and age. Yeah. Someone's asked the question online, uh, what time is the Zoom class tomorrow? And our, our certified Eden associate training is, uh, we're teaching Tuesdays and Thursdays uh, so it's 2.30 to 4.30 Saskatchewan time. So I guess that would be 12.30 to 2.30 there. And there are eight classes. So for the next four weeks, we'll be teaching Tuesday and Thursday. And um, I'm going to put our email up, address up in the next slide. And so if, you, if anyone's interested, um, I'd ask that you uh, just send me off an email or go to our website and you can download uh, a registration form and send that in to us. And if you miss a class, um, it's a, made available through a recording. Um, so you, you don't have to be present for every class, but we really encourage people to do that. I don't know if there's any more questions. Any more questions, feel free to unmute yourself or type in the chat. I'd encourage you to, um, if you're looking for something fun to watch some night, uh, to go to the NFB website and watch A Year at Sherbrooke. And um, it's, um, it's a pretty good documentary. We didn't have a lot of say in, in it because it was a National Film Board documentary, but it's a really good, um, it's a really good film.
Thanks, Lisa. The format for the conversations to empower staff. Um, every year we do what's called an annual review. It's not a performance review. Uh, we manage performance separately from this chat and we sit down and we actually go through the domains of well-being and say to staff, you know, um, do you feel well known? Do you feel like you belong here? Uh, do you have good friends here? Um, we, uh, we're often um, encouraging relationships with staff and and so that's really important. Um, you know, are you having enough opportunities to grow or are there some things that you'd like to, to, to do? And we'll see if we can help you out with that. Uh, do you feel that you're connected to the things that are really, really important to you? So we go through the domains of well-being with the staff to find out, you know, what it's like, because work is such a big part of your life that you really should be finding well-being in, in spending that amount of time every day. And so we sit down and have that conversation with the staff member once a year and possibly mm. more often. We ask them how their families are doing. We ask them for their opportunities for joy and how we can help them. And so it's really, it, that's probably the best investment of time that we make with our staff at Sherbrooke and Central Haven. And so we have lots of formats for that. We kind of mix it up each year. Thanks, Catherine. She says it's brilliant. <laughs> Thanks to both of you. It was lovely seeing you again. And I hope you, uh, Sue Ellen, you stay involved at least peripherally and uh, support old people like me to try to make changes out here on the coast. You can't stop me. <laughs> At a girl. <laughs> okay, we'll see ya. Thank you so very much, everyone. We enjoyed our time with you and, you know, help us change this. Uh, it, it can be so different and it can be, it can be so, it's so worthwhile for everybody who lives and works in one of these places. Well, thank you very much, both Sue Ellen and Cheryl. We really appreciate you having come and spoken to us tonight. Um, thank you so much for a great talk. Welcome. You're so welcome. Take care, everyone. Okay. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.